Uh, so Jessica Peterson is an er, invertebrate ecologist with the Minnesota Biological Survey with the Department of Natural Resources. Um, she's broadly trained entomologist with research experience in butterflies, bees, and flies. Jessica. Thank you very much. Thank you all um, for the invitation to speak to you today about insects. Um, my work is in, uh, my PhD work was in crane flies, so I often uh, joke with a, a group of people that like birds, those are flies and not cranes, but I, um, I feel like, I felt like I could walk in the door this morning a little bit um, more confident because I saw my first snowy owl this morning and I, I'm not at all a bird um, watcher, but thanks to Bob Dunlap um, for the tip uh, and I'm, I'm just so tickled <laughs> and pleased. Um, but today I'm going to talk to you about insects. So um, I'm an uh, invertebrate ecologist for the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources and the Minnesota Biological Survey. And so um, my job primarily is to um, survey and monitor insects in Minnesota. And so I'll tie it a little bit to birds, um, but primarily I'm going to talk about insects. So um, this is a, a lovely uh, mantid fly sitting on this milkweed. I don't know why they're always on the milkweeds. They must eat something on there, but I love these little guys. They're always a treat. Uh, so insect diversity, we've heard a lot about bird diversity. Um, talk about insect diversity a little bit to just kind of set the stage. Um, so I love this quote from Sir Robert May, to a good approximation, all species are insects. I think that's uh, particularly true and obviously important for birds because they, a lot of uh, birds eat insects. So there's approximately one million uh, described species of insects on Earth. That's 80% of the total species on Earth. Um, but that known diversity is just a, uh, just a fraction of the estimated diversity. There have been wild estimates of, of insect diversity worldwide, those that are you know, yet to be described. The people that recently have kind of um, narrowed in on this 7 million uh, figure. But it's really, it's really unknown. And not only is it unknown worldwide, it's unknown um, here in Minnesota. So I often like to ask a little audience participation here. Um, how many species of insects do you think are there in Minnesota? So we know there's 1 million described species on Earth. How many, and 7 million perhaps possible. Yeah, go ahead. 6,000. OK, anybody else want to hazard a guess? 10,000, 100,000. Well, so that's really interesting. In a group of entomologists, I usually get um, ranges somewhere between 10 and 100,000. So I think, I think you all were right on. I really don't have an answer to this question, unfortunately, which is also always why people get really mad at me, right? Like, wait a minute, you asked me a question you don't know the answer to. Um, so I don't know the answer to that question, and, and I'll show you a little bit about why. Um, so that's talking about species richness, right? And, but we also want to think about species abundance. So um, there's a, approximately, I don't know how people have calculated these numbers, 10 quintillion insects, individual insects um, alive at any time, right? That's a pretty amazing number. 200 million insects for each human. Uh, so we have all this diversity, but as we probably all know, a lot of it um, has perhaps been lost recently. To, to a first approximation, all species are extinct. Um, and perhaps that's um, being accelerated by a variety of things. So we can think about those, the insect apocalypse, so to speak, in a couple of different ways, right? We can think about it uh, from a, a richness perspective and an abundance perspective. I kind of like to break it down in that way, because um, that's, how, that's how a lot of my work um, has to go as well. And I'll show you that in here in a little bit. Um, so there's only 70 documented insect extinctions. And in part, that number is probably dramatically lower than reality because there's really too much unknown to document. Um, there's not enough people out there looking uh, to prove these extinctions. And proving extinctions is really hard, right? And these guys are tiny, um, so it makes it even harder. But we do know there are some local extinctions, and so I'll, I'll share that with you in a little bit about, about Minnesota. And so this is, a, this is a recent paper from Seabold et al. trying to document that loss uh, and, and showing a decline in the number of insect species. But we can also think about abundance, right? Some insect species are certainly declining in abundance. Some that used to be quite common are declining in abundance. Um, abundance or biomass, however you want to think about it. And so 
Um, these two figures are from some of the recent uh, review papers that have been written about insect declines, showing uh, a, a variety of, or, or how, how this decline varies by taxa, right? It varies across orders from beetles to um, Hymenoptera, Lepidoptera, Odonates, and Orthoptera. Uh, but it, p there's estimates anywhere from 33 to 45% of global decline in abundance of insects. But there's also some species, and I always want to make this caveat, there's also some species that are benefiting from um, this change that's happening, right? This global, global change, primarily due to agricultural intensification and climate change. Um, there's winners and losers, right? So for bees, we think about um, many of the bees are doing just fine, many are declining, and, and the rest are, are perhaps increasing in abundance. Um, but we, we really have a hard time putting a number on the degree to which insects are declining worldwide, but also in Minnesota. And so I always caution a little bit against these um, insect apocalypse type. Um, it just, it's meant to cause fear, right? Uh, and much of this is driven by uh, data that comes from Europe and North America, and primarily Europe. So this is a map showing you um, those studies that feed into this notion of insect apocalypse and where they come from. So really the magnitude and the extent of the decline um, or the loss is unknown. And that's true for everywhere, including here in Minnesota. Um, but to tie it a little bit to birds, uh, this is a, a recent paper by Doug Talami and uh, Shriver uh, in 2021 where they're talking, the authors in the paper talk about, uh, you know, there's, there's obvious bird declines, there's obvious in, insect declines, are they related? And so they argue that bird species that have declined are those that are most dependent on insects for food. So they argue it's not just a correlation, that there's some sort of causation that's happening there. Um, and so, so obviously all of this um, insect declines are very important for, for birds, um, but I, I guess as an entomologist I would argue that um, we should all be interested in, in these declines, just inherently for the love of biodiversity. So, um, so the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus a little bit on, on Minnesota and what I do, um, just to kind of set the stage about, about insect declines and then suggest that it, it's, it's really hard <laughs> to know this about Minnesota, right? People want to know, are, are, are Minnesota insects declining? It's, it's very hard to know. Um, so I'll sh share a little bit about what I do and, and how I'm approaching that subject, but it's, um, I'm just one person. <laughs> and if we have, you know, my, my estimate uh, is somewhere probably around 60,000 insects in Minnesota. So this is our state list of butterflies as an example um, for, uh, you know, how we might track or think about decline. And those that are in red are likely extirpated. And they're, they're, it's obviously likely because although we've spent some time looking, there really aren't as many people out looking for these things as there are people out looking for birds. So um, these are all of the state listed butterflies. So all of the state endangered butterflies, threatened and special concern species. And so this is alarming, right? If, if we have all of these species and, and the majority of them are likely extirpated, it's really difficult. We, we, there's probably species we need to add to this list, but we need regular monitoring and surveys in order to update this list. Um, so, so that's not, not encouraging, right? Um, and then if we dial down a little bit more and we look at the um, prairie skippers, some little critters that are pretty near and dear to my heart, um, these are the, the skippers that were once, um, I, I hesitate to use the word common, but they were once found throughout Minnesota or in portions of Minnesota, especially in the prairies. Um, and uh, they rely entirely, their entire existence relies on prairie, on native, um, unbroken prairie. And so you might expect that due to habitat loss and other factors that these have declined. So these are the ones that are likely extirpated, most of them from that list that I showed you prior. Um, and so it, it's really quite depressing to go out in the prairie and not be able to see these little guys anymore. Um, but it's also very difficult to monitor them um, when, they're, when they're no longer here. So the, the ones we do continue to monitor um, are Dakota Skipper and Leonard Skipper. We do uh, quite a bit of intensive monitoring. Dusted Skipper, 
Um, right now, we're just looking at occupancy, and same with Pawnee. So I'm going to dive down a little bit more and talk about the Dakota Skipper. Um, so this is a little critter that, um, this is a map showing all of the, it's, it's not showing up very well, but it's primarily in the western parts of the prairies in Minnesota was uh, historically found. All of those black little dots are the extirpated populations or likely extirpated populations. So as you can see, it was pretty widespread. And in terms of a, a broader geographic scope, there are populations of Dakota skipper still um, quite uh, abundant in North Dakota. So the, the uh, historic range used to go from North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, and down into Iowa. So it's a relatively narrow geographic range of this critter. And now it's obviously much smaller. So the adults fly for about two weeks in June and July, and the larvae feed on these prairie grasses. And there's this one remaining population that we attempt to um, monitor. And uh, we didn't start really looking um, broadly for this species until relatively recently. Um, so these are, this is just a histogram of the number of sites that were surveyed each year and whether or not it was found in blue or not found in orange. And so it wasn't until about 2007 when people started becoming alarmed that this species was in decline that um, we started looking for it and really not finding it. So this suggests to me that we need to really continue um, these negative surveys as well in documenting negative, um, negative findings. Um, but primarily what I spend a lot of my time, and Bob Dunlap helps with this work as well, is doing uh, Dakota skipper uh, population monitoring. So the objective here is to try to understand how we can better serve this species. Uh, we don't really have a lot of information about um, what kind of management effects might uh, have on this species, whether or not we hay a prairie or graze a prairie or burn it. We don't really know. And so um, we embarked on this project a couple of years ago at the DNR and uh, doing some pretty intensive sampling using line transect distance sampling to estimate the population size. And so here's Bob. He was out there um, this summer doing some great work um, uh, monitoring this species. And we estimate now that the population is somewhere between 200 and 730 individuals. So we're excited um, to continue this work. And it gives us a sense of this abundance estimate, right? But this is just for one species. So um, we, we, a lot of work goes into to getting these estimates just for one species. We also monitor their habitat. Um, a couple of the uh, botanists here, Dustin Graham and Nathan Dahlberg, have monitored the habitat. So we can uh, bring that data in, those data in, um, to account for habitat changes through time and, and by management. So um, we're super excited because the uh, portion of the habitat was hayed in this September, and we'll continue the monitoring in 2022 and see how um, the skipper responds and how the habitat responds. Um, so that's just one glimpse of the work that we do on populations uh, in Minnesota, populations of insects. We can't do this with very many species because it's so intense. Um, so I also want to tell you a little bit about the work that we do uh, asking, you know, who's here? What species are even here? Kind of getting at that question of what is the, uh, what is the diversity of insects in Minnesota? Because we really can't protect biodiversity before we know what diversity we have. Um, and these, the results of this kind of work um, making state lists of species and just surveying the, the insect diversity help inform state lists of species status. And um, it's just primarily through documenting occurrences. So going back to that found um, information. And that's where we are with most species of insects in Minnesota. Um, so these data also contribute to environmental review in Minnesota, as well as U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service federal listing decisions. So they're really important for a variety of reasons. Um, and so these are a few of the species that we, we do that with. Uh, fox moth is a listed species here in Minnesota that we try to survey for. Uh, Dusted skipper is another, and then the, the rusty patch bumblebee. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit, dive down a little bit more into that survey work and what we do. Um, so uh, a, big, a big aspect of, of the DNR MBS insect crew is, um, has been since about 2015 to document the wild bee diversity in Minnesota. And the primary goal of this project has been um, to just create a list of Minnesota bees. 
there hasn't previously been a list. Um, the, the previous list was uh, very old, and the author <laughs> makes some comment in the paper that, that this li list is woefully inadequate. So it's not really even a legitimate list. Um, so, we, so we set out with this goal. Um, we also have done some outreach events, and, and we're at the beginning stages of uh, beginning to assess status, so um, status and trends of these species, so what species there might be of conservation concern. Uh, so the way that we do this is we uh, go, we've gone throughout the state, and we primarily use bull traps. So these are yellow and blue UV bulls and white that we set out, and it's just the insects, um, including bees, are attracted to these bulls. And um, they go in there, it's filled with soapy water, and they die. Um, so they, these bulls have the potential to trap a lot of insects and a lot of um, what sometimes people call bycatch. Um, one person's trash is another person's treasure, so I don't really like to use that term <laughs> very much, and we do keep a lot of that um, bycatch, the, the non-bees, uh, from those bulls and try to farm it out to people that might want it. Um, but these bulls catch a lot of bees or have the potential to, and that's the primary um, bulk of our samples. And then we do supplement with hand netting, so um, just walking around with a hand net and netting off of flowers. And then we have a, a variety of other trapping methods that we've used as well. So um, we do this work between April and October every year since 2015. We've been going around and doing this work. And these are the sites that we've visited thus far. So you know, as you can see, this is a large body of work. And now our list is up to about 475 species. That's not just the bees that we've caught, but the bees at the museum that are there historically, as well as the University of Minnesota Bee Lab. We've compiled all of these data together and come up with a, a list of about 475. Um, so, but the DNR efforts have added about seven species to that list, so we're, we're pretty excited about that. And now we have a potential list of species of special concern that we're going to take that farther and try to understand whether or not those species really are um, rare or just rare in our database for one reason or another. Um, so here's a couple of species that just show you what we learned from an expanded county record perspective. So in the green in these maps are um, museum records, so um, records at, at the University of Minnesota Insect Collection Museum, and then the crosshatched are where our Minnesota Biological Survey records have expanded our, our information, our knowledge. So, um, you know, it, it's, <laughs> this is just a first step at understanding the diversity uh, um, in the state, and uh, we are we're excited to continue this work and to continue understanding about the bees in Minnesota and all insects in Minnesota. But this just I think this bee survey gives you a snapshot of really what it takes um, to be able to understand the diversity of bees in Minnesota in order to you know make that next step of how how is the loss impacting other systems, you know whether it be pollination or bird diversity or bird abundance. Um, so we're really in in the infant stages of understanding insects in Minnesota to, that we can't possibly make this next leap of understanding then what are the effects of those losses, right? We're still, we're still making our lists. Um, so, so I just want to leave you with, you know, what can you do to help? Um, because I think I, I want to know what I can do to help, so perhaps some of you do too. Um, you know, many insects are host-specific, including caterpillars. And so it's really important if you want to know, if, if you want to attract something um, to your yard or, or wherever, um, what, what you're interested in attracting, right? And so that might be uh, planting a specific host plant, right? We all know that monarchs eat milkweed, but many other um, caterpillars and bees are hosts to specific plants as well. And so Doug Tlamy um, is a big proponent of planting oaks. Uh, they have about 550 species of Lepidoptera that are host to oak alone in the Northeast. So that, that's huge. That can, um, that can make a really big dent in the, the caterpillars. Um, so planting native plants, of course, is, is paramount to saving the insects. Um, many insects we can document from photos on iNaturalist. A lot of them we cannot. But it's, it's still important to, to document them. So if you're out and about, you know, grab a picture and, and throw it on iNaturalist. 
And I guess the biggest take home for me, um, if, if people want to start thinking about insects, is, is simply to notice them. They're all around us. They're everywhere. Kids see them all the time. Um, but as adults, we tend not to notice them. So simply noticing insects, I think, is huge. Uh, and, and, and then if you're excited, you could become a parataxonomist, right? You could, you could start to get a microscope and look at them under the, um, under the microscope. This book uh, was recently published by Scott King, The Flower Flies of Minnesota, who um, just passed away right before it was published. And he was a, an amateur, um, and he, he dove, dove into the flower flies of Minnesota and published this wonderful book. Um, and so anybody can do it. <laughs> I, I truly believe that. Um, and then supporting taxonomists and, and natural history, history collections is really important. The University of Minnesota Insect Collection has four million species, uh, four million specimens, I'm sorry. And, and it's huge, and, and so it needs our support. And anybody can contact the curators and go visit it, and that also gains support for them because the Minnesotans are using it. Um, so that's my, my down and dirty uh, list of things you can do. Uh, most of this work was funded by the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, the bee survey work, and a lot of the, the um, butterfly survey work as well. So buy your lottery tickets. Um, thank you. All right, do we have any questions? I, I see on the web that there is ebutterfly.org, yeah. which is, I assume, like eBird. D does iNaturalist uh, collect uh, location data uh, in the same way that we report bird, bird locations? Yep, it does. And it, um, it will obscure uh, rare species which is um, nice for some respects, too. So, Bumblebee Watch is another one if you're interested in bumblebees to, um, to put bumblebee records on there as well. But e, e Butterfly is another one. There's so many. <laughs> um, I sometime back read an article in the Wisconsin DNR magazine about the impact of uh, megafauna, specifically bison, in prairie areas and the increase in diversity. Do you, have you done any work on that or have seen research done on that? I haven't personally. Um, you know, it, it's not surprising to me. Any kind of um, disturbance in our um, grasslands in particular and other ecosystems as well can cause it such that the habitat is variable and therefore a variety of species can exist. Um, you know, it, it, the dung is a huge missing component from a lot of our ecosystems as well, and the DNR is working to bring cattle onto some of the wildlife management areas and the grasslands, and that's um, potentially great, you know, that, that it adds that input. Um, dung beetles in Minnesota are pretty cool too. <laughs> Um, insects, as you pointed out, are abundant, and um, so if you were interested in contributing, where do you start? I mean, they, there's a, you know, a few years ago, there was no knowledge of dragonflies until that whole program geared up with a field guide and everything else, and uh, contributed a lot. And so, and pollinators, of course, a big case has been made for, but there's lots and lots of groups of insects. And so are there target groups really that are, that there's much less knowledge about if somebody's going to go into it? And, and secondly, um, you know, where is the, they brought up iNaturalist or various web links. Is, is the DNR a reporting location or is it just online? And where does the university fit into it in terms of their collections and knowledge of it? So I'm just asking again where, where the avenue to even report is or how. Yeah, so I mean, I guess I would start in my backyard, um, you know, and, and from, a, from, a, from the perspective of things that we know the least about, I guess uh, wasps always um, come to mind. Um, you know, there's, there's jokes about beetle diversity 
Um, but I think WASP diversity, most of the literature suggests that WASP diversity is, is far greater than, than any other insect order. Um, and, and so, you know, I think most of those species would probably require a microscope for identification, but not all of them. Um, so starting in your backyard taking pictures is a pretty amazing thing. You know, I, I found a, a pretty cool fly in my, my front yard <laughs> that I didn't know even existed. <laughs> my husband's an entomologist too, and we were, we were pretty astounded during COVID to find this little flower fly. So, um, you know, starting in your backyard and just, and just taking pictures, getting down on the ground and, and taking pictures. Uh, you know, the University of Minnesota, you could contact their insect collection. They're always looking for volunteers, especially people that are really want to be dedicated to um, helping curate that collection. It takes a lot of work um, to keep that collection up to date. So there's tons of avenues. The DNR doesn't necessarily, um, you know, keep a list of, of, uh, of detections of insects. iNaturalist does a much better job of that than we possibly could. So, uh, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Jessica, I, on your last slide, you had, uh, among other things, support a taxonomist. How exactly would you do that? Well, you know, being vocal, <laughs> talking to your friends and neighbors <laughs> about, about the important work that taxonomists do. Um, it, there's, there's, without Dr. Zach Portman at the University of Minnesota, we wouldn't be able to do this work that we're doing with the bee survey. Um, I was just talking to Clinton about this. He, he, he goes through all of our specimens, and I'm so thankful for him because it's a it's a huge body of work. Um, and so, you know, if you, you can give money to the Bee Lab too, if your if your dollar um, if you want to spend spend money, definitely a donation to the Bee Lab, the University of Minnesota Bee Lab is a good thing too. Yeah. Thank you, Jessica. Yeah. 